Thanks for watching the personal history of games. I'm your host, Eric Canius. Back in September of 2019, I was lucky enough to record a few episodes of the show during PAX West. Today's guest is Tom Francis. You can find his work as designer, writer, and programmer on such great games as Gunpoint, Heat Signature, and Tactical Breach Wizards. With the guy as busy as he is, I was grateful to sit down with him to play some Elder Scrolls Morrowind while talking reptiles, writing, and design. Here's that conversation. All right, the control is yours. I did not make a save game for this because I like seeing how people start <laughs> these sorts of games. I don't play these games often, so I like seeing how what's uh, someone's start for this. How much Morrowind did you play? Was it a Oh my lot? god, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been one of the first games you got really obsessed with, where I played it for, you know, over 100 hours. Ooh. It's funny, like, in those days, that was extraordinary. But now I have friends who play Dota, <laughs> and 100 hours <laughs> to, like, a Dota player is like, oh, so you just started? <laughs> <laughs> how the times have changed. Morrowind has a great opening, as I recall, in terms of, like, how you, how you fill in who your character is. It's uh, fictionalized in a cool way. Yeah. I liked it because it was shorter than the other, than the other <laughs> modern ones that I've played. Yeah. So I haven't played Morrowind. I played uh, Oblivion and Skyrim a bit. But I knew friends that loved this game as well. Did you play the other Elder Scrolls before this? No, this is my first. And I didn't know about the series until this. Okay. And it was a case of, like, there was all of the RPGs that my friends were into were either turn-based or you had a party of people and or when you attack someone, there was just a chance you'd hit. Right. And... When I heard about this and started seeing trailers and, and screenshots and stuff, I kind of was checking off mentally a list of like, oh, you're just one person and it's first person. And if you like hit someone with a fireball, that means it hits them. <laughs> and that is what got me excited about it, basically. I, I didn't know of any game like that. Um, Stand up. There you go. You were dreaming. <laughs> What's your... The whole voice acting okay. and all that. It's going to be Pentadact. Where did that name come from? Because that's your Twitter handle and stuff. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I think when I was a teenager, my friends and I would do sort of like, not D and D campaigns, but just uh, make up our own characters and stories and stuff, and and use those in various contexts. And I always needed a name that was sort of fantasy sounding but unique. And I was really into frogs. I love frogs. <laughs> and uh, one of my favorites is the South American bullfrog, which is its Latin name is Leptodactyla dipentadactylus. Wow. And I just liked that sequence of <laughs> syllables. It just sounded cool. I had this like, giant atlas of reptiles and amphibians. I'd leaf through that looking for fantasy names. <laughs> and that was the one that stuck. Cool. And it's, it's actually been a really good choice for a username because it's more than eight. It's nine characters. And most need you to be eight or more. Mm -hmm. And no one's ever taken it. Yeah. <laughs> the only person ever. <laughs> that's pretty sweet to hit on that so early. Mine was E-Rock, and that's always taken and always bad. <laughs> actually, before that. An Unreal Tournament, I'd use Da Bomb because I thought that was cool when I was 10. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. embarrassing. So you lucked out not getting an embarrassing I mean, name. Yeah, mine is kind of dorky, but it, it doesn't sort of, you can't it tell. Hides it hides Yeah, it <laughs> very well. <laughs> I'm playing Morrowind for the first time since uh, since it was new, I think. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> I, I might have gone back to it at some point in my PC Gamer time to like write a retrospective or something, but that even that would have been more than 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of amazed at how good it looks. <laughs> yeah, it, it looks pretty good. It really doesn't Finally like arrived. running on new machines. Like, it only sees my laptop's Intel card and not the NVIDIA card, which is very strange, but huh. I have no idea how any of that stuff works, so. <laughs> There's a scroll bar for rotating your face. <laughs> <laughs> this must have been pretty mind-blowing, though. I don't, I don't really know the context of when this game come, came out. I know that people loved it because it came out on the Xbox, and that was like a big win for Bethesda of just being on the consoles. But other than that, were you playing other fantasy games at this time? Uh, I don't think so. I think I started with Ultima Underworld, and that's actually quite similar to this in a lot of ways. Um, but then I didn't find anything else like that since. Uh, there was always some reason that it wasn't my cup of tea, and then Morrowind was the first thing that, that like filled that box and in a much more, uh, you know, immersive and, and gorgeous way. Like, the funny thing is, maybe this is a graphics card thing, but I remember the water being stunning, and that's the only part of this that looks really <laughs> ugly right now. <laughs> I mean, at the time, though, if you, like, lowered the resolution or, yeah, like, everything looks pretty crisp. Yeah, the water does look a little... I think, so I'll try it in a minute, but once I get out into the world, but when you waded through it, like, ripples would come out of Ooh. where you waded, and that was, like, amazing for mm -hmm. the time. What is Ultima Underworld? You, you mentioned that before we started recording here. Yeah, that's a, it's a first-person 
game where you're thrown in a dungeon and as you explore, you you start to realize it's much more than a dungeon and you are, you know, killing rats and goblins and stuff. And then at some point I found, I opened like a door and found an orc there and it didn't attack me and it talked to me. Oh. And I discovered that there was a whole tribe of orcs living here and they, I could trade with them and I could talk to their leader and find out what was going on with them. Uh, and they, there were these shrines people would worship at and suddenly realized like, wow, there's a, just a world in here. Like this is not just a thing where you try and get a high score or you try and avoid dying. Like this is a, a yes, place that you can explore. It has its own like people and, and you'll have to be cultures and stuff. Yeah, it seems released. like uh, just there a transference of like D&D &D type storytelling with this like huge world with all these characters in it into a video game. And that would be pretty uh, pretty big deal to, to see that sort of depth. Yeah. Because I was really into choose your own adventure books and stuff, and right. um, I never played D and D when I was young. But we did do like a the fighting fantasy books had a sort of D and D type series where they would do like it's almost like a D and D campaign, but ninety percent of it's written for you, and you, you get a little bit of freedom. And I was the DM, and it was absolute hell to try and get all of my friends <laughs> together at the same place at the same time. But we loved it when we did it, and uh, I especially loved just sort of getting to make them feel empowered and excited about what they were doing. That's 90% of what I hear about D&D &D and that sort of thing is it's impossible to get friends together. <laughs> yeah. So having a video game that did that for you must have been great. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously Morrowind is just like, goes so much further in that sense of like this being a world that you explore and yeah. rather than a game that you try and complete uh, and just like living in this, this world. I remember playing it so much that, you know, it'd be early hours of the morning and I'd be feeling tired and I would just sleep in the game. <laughs> and then when my character woke up, I'd think, okay, oh, that's taken care of. <laughs> oh my God. I just kind of forget, oh wait, no, I have needs as well. <laughs> that sounds like a near problematic time. If it happens in the game, it happens in real life. Okay, we've got to answer <laughs> these questions, so I need to read this. On a clear day, you chance upon a strange animal, its leg trapped in a hunter's claw snare? Judging from the bleeding, it will not survive long. I could not interfere with a natural evolution of events. I'm not sure that's the right <laughs> phrase. But rather take the opportunity to learn more about a strange animal that you have never seen before. I could draw my dagger, mercifully ending its life with a single thrust, or use herbs from your pack to put it to sleep. Wouldn't, wow. Aren't B and so C similar? Well, all these like ended in death. So. Amoral scientist option. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what class <laughs> that leads you to. Uh... I think I wouldn't want to use up my herbs. I'd use the dagger. Yeah. <laughs> and you can still study it after you kill it. Yeah. <laughs> That's my philosophy of life. <laughs> oh, no. I'll learn about this after it's dead. <laughs> oh, no. Are you big into animals? Do you like the, the frogs and the reptiles? Yep. I love frogs. Um, and yeah, I like lizards as well. My friend Rick was into lizards and I was into frogs. So we, we covered the herpetology <laughs> bases there. And I like cats and dogs as well. I especially love dogs, but I don't have either. Mm. Okay. There's, there's another herb-based response here. <laughs> oh. My father is giving me a choice of chores. I can gather herbs for your mother who's preparing dinner. I can work in the forge with him cast... This one is a very thinly disguised class yes. choice. <laughs> it's almost like, your father asks you which class you'd like to be in an RPG. <laughs> I could work in the forge with him casting a new plow. Uh, or I could catch fish in the stream using a net and line. I'm going to gather some your herbs. Your cousin has oh. given you a very embarrassing nickname and even worse likes to call you it in front of your friends. Very relatable. You've asked him to stop, <laughs> but he finds it very amusing to watch you blush. <laughs> they're, they're like a census and excise officer is asking you this. <laughs> Although the most efficient way for us to get your basic information is to see how you'd react if you had a really embarrassing nickname. <laughs> Make up a story that makes your nickname a badge of honor and instead, uh, instead of something humiliating. Beat up your cousin, then tell him that if he ever calls you that nickname again, you'll bloody him worse than this time. <laughs> Make up an even more embarrassing nickname for him and use Ooh. it constantly until he learns his lesson. <laughs> oh, that's obviously the smart play. Wonder what they do. No way. And tell their lord whether a father were is telling the truth or not. You believe what? Oh my God! I've got to have. This seems like it's to weed out telepaths, to be honest. <laughs> a telepath sympathize. Are you now or have you ever been a member of a telepath group? <laughs> In these times, there's a necessary evil. Although you do not necessarily like the idea, a telepath could have certain advantages during time it's of war. Like, I love cops. <laughs> <laughs> this is a terrible practice. A person's thoughts are his own, and no one, not even a king, has the right to make 
such an invasion of yeah. Yeah. Send you to the market with a list of goods to buy. <laughs> this guy's emphasis on words is very strange. <laughs> I actually love, I love the voice acting in this because the Imperials in Morrowind are they're like an invading force. They they're sort of occupying uh -huh. uh, Vardenfell, which is like a, it's a dark elf land, but they are a global superpower, and the dark elves can't really do anything about them. And so they're just here, but they're playing the good guys, and obviously they're very <laughs> recognizable, sort of a mix of Roman and yeah, like medieval. The allegory is um, England, and so I love the just like sort of like smarminess of them. They're all so like, yeah. I mean, imperious is the obvious <laughs> word. <but laughs> and that, I think that was the thing that struck me about Morrowind and made me uh, get really into it. Was it the Imperials aren't the good guys, uh, and neither are the dark elves. The dark elves are not uh, like you know. Um, virtuous, nature-loving, pure race that's like uh, all sweetness and light. They keep slaves. Oh, <laughs> no. They have dark shit going on. <laughs> but they are being occupied by the Imperials. Mm -hmm. Imperials are sort of like probably more aligned with uh, with our values, but they are basically have no right to be there and are just there through sheer force. And finding that kind of nuance and hmm. like just problematic situations that weren't easy to pick a side with was really interesting. Yeah. Or it's not so much that, I mean, he doesn't ask you to pick a side either, which is kind of nice. Uh, and so you just get to exist in this world where kind of everyone has their own problems and that felt a lot more real to me. Cool. I didn't know anything about that. There's just, there seems to be something about the fantasy realm that allows people to delve into these topics a little easier. Yeah. It's less head on, but it uh, still gets to cover something. Yeah, it's like, if done right, it lets you examine the a core issue or question without linking it to a specific real world reference point, yes. which if you do that, it brings with it a whole load of baggage that might not be relevant to the thing you're trying to investigate. So it kind of lets you take a question in isolation. Right. That makes me like fantasy more because I don't like <laughs> fantasy pretty much. <well. laughs> I don't know why. It's only about it rubs me the I mean, way. it's also really easy to get it wrong. Like there are so many, yes. so many analogs for racism yes. in these games that really <laughs> feel like, oh, you're, you're making all kinds of equivalencies here that are not good. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this one. After your mother sends you to the market with a list of goods to buy... Oh, sorry. Uh, after you finish that, and you find, by mistake, a shopkeeper has given you too much money back in exchange for the items. Uh, do I return it? Uh, do I decide to put the extra money to good use and purchase items that would help your family? Pocket. Or pocket the extra money? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sensing the thief option. Uh, knowing that shopkeepers... In general tend to overcharge customers anyway. Yeah, well, if he has an intent to overcharge, then that's your win. But you uh, can put it to good use, I guess. These are not mutually exclusive, these last two, True. because you could... Yes, yeah, so you could still do good things with it. Yeah, I'm going to say I would do good things oh, with it. Oh, fine. You witness a thief cut a purse from a noble. Even as he does so, the noble notices and calls for the city guards. In his haste to get away, the thief drops the purse near you. Surprisingly, <laughs> no one seems to notice the bag of coins at your feet. What? Oh, wow, this is very similar. Mm -hmm. So I can pick up the bag and pocket it, knowing that the extra windfall will help my family in times of trouble. Well, I already helped them with the last bag of coins <laughs> I got, so they're fine. <laughs> pick up the bag and signal to the guard, knowing that, that the only honorable thing to do is to return the money to the rightful owner. Leave the bag there, knowing it's better not to get involved. Oh, that's... I, I can't lie, that is what I would do. I would <laughs> leave well enough. Me too, I agree. <laughs> do nothing, see what happens. Walk away. Just <laughs> get out of there. Fork in hand, you run into your friend from the homestead near your own. He offers to do it for you in return for a future favor of his choosing. Oh no. What do you do? <laughs> Never owe someone an unspecified favor. That's <laughs> the worst. Yep. Uh, and decline is often knowing that your father expects you to do the work and it's better not to be in debt. Or ask him to help you, knowing that two people can do the job faster than one, and agree to help him with one task of his choosing. No, that's your a. Your mother asks you to the help. Third one's bad choice. Stove. While you're working, a very hot pipe slips its moorings and falls towards. <gasps> what do you do? Push your mother out of the way. Position yourself between the pipe and your mother. Grab the hot pipe and try and push it away. It's either A or C. <laughs> this is like this would only be a difficult situation if one of these was easier to do than the others, <laughs> or like, obviously I don't want to do an option where I have to hold the hot pipe. Yeah. <laughs> if that works, then the baker that's... gives you a sweet roll. Delighted you I had forgotten how many of these there are. This is going on quite well after all the dialogues done, but, but I mean, I did this to myself with not starting <laughs> after this. <laughs> so I was just clicking, as I do, click very quickly through all of these and get whatever. 
I'm going to act like I would give him the sweet roll, but then at the last minute, throw it in the air, hoping that they'll pay <laughs> attention to it long enough for you to get what? shot. What? To get shot? Oh, get a shot in on the leader. Wow. Entering town, you find that you are witness to a very well-dressed man running from a crowd. He screams to you for help. The crowd behind him seems very angry. Stand aside and what? do nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't need to see the other options. Spells oh, my personality and, and past reflect a spell sword. They're, I guess they're big on just standing there and doing nothing. I guess so. You mentioned you were born under a certain sign. I don't use star sign. What would that be? <laughs> I like, so the letter that preceded mentioned I was born under a certain sign, but I didn't say which one. <laughs> hey, by the way, I was born under a certain <laughs> sign. But I'll never tell until now. So I seem to remember the serpent is a good one because you can poison people. Or actually the shadow lets you go invisible. Yeah. Ooh. I think that's one where, like, getting that as a spell is much harder. Mm. Oh my god, there's so many stats. Like, I'm <laughs> yep, that's all fine. <laughs> I had this strange, like, hot, like, hypertext kind of conversation thing where just certain keywords, you could just click on them and you're sort of saying them at somebody. Right. Aha. <laughs> now I can steal. <laughs> Gotta fill my pockets with whatever's on this table. Nobody can see me. Oh, <laughs> the noise for stealing something sounds like you're eating it. <laughs> Just gonna eat all this silverware. <laughs> Just one big chomp. This is just a blank page. Yeah, it was. I think it was the paper that was under the bread. Uh oh, <laughs> you had to read it. <laughs> and now you're third person, which is always the best way to play these games is third person. They never look weird at all. <laughs> Especially that jump. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you could jump because the OK button is on space. So what? space oh, is e. use and E is jump. Uh. <laughs> That's the controls of this game. <laughs> That's why I didn't get it because it's absolutely backwards. On the nose. Your... And we're out. But then this the is open a good bit. world. You stay in a third person. <laughs> the strafing is always okay. my favorite because it looks terrible. <laughs> <laughs> or when you're running forward and then moving sideways. Yeah, because you just oh, yeah, yeah, there is no run and strafe. <laughs> They can at least just have the the model point. Oh, the backwards run is fantastic. <laughs> Getting out of any sticky situations. <laughs> oh, nope, didn't want this conversation. <laughs> so, the whole purpose of this podcast is we get 20 minutes in. <laughs> is, is to kind of uh, look at the through line of things. So we're here on the third floor of the West End in Seattle, Washington. Uh, recording this podcast. But where did it all begin? Was, did you have games at home growing up? Or was it all... Yeah, my... My dad, my dad had a PC. Actually, I guess he got us a BBC Micro first. <laughs> it was that long ago. You uh, have to explain what that is. Oh, so that that is a computer made by uh, the BBC as an educational thing. Uh, <laughs> no. Like, I guess partly government funded for schools and stuff. Mm. Uh, but it, you could play games on it, and so like Battle Zone, <laughs> the tanks, the wireframe tanks one that was on there. Uh, Granny's Garden is a terrifying educational <laughs> game where that? if you like these really trivial or nonsense puzzles where sometimes you just have to guess things and there's no way to know mm. but if you get it wrong like a granny eats you <laughs> oh, <laughs> granny no. is a witch and <laughs> okay. uh, her face is like drawn in these ASCII blocks that, that with like jagged sort of rectangular teeth that <laughs> <laughs> chomp you uh, or you don't see anything actually being eaten she just you see her jaws like chomping in a really <laughs> terrifying way and it probably probably looms larger in the mind than it than it would if i saw it today but that game was yes, today you're old enough to go i'm not afraid of you anymore <laughs> you don't scare me but then she chomps at you and it's too late so that was uh i guess the first experience of games i don't think they'd really hooked me at that point and then once we got a pc we just looked up in a magazine what the three highest scoring games ever were they had like a reviews <laughs> table basically um and so we just bought the three best games that existed which were ultima underworld monkey island 2 mm. and actually, i actually can't remember what the third one was now but yeah ultima underworld obviously as mentioned uh was a bit of a revelation for me and years later morrowind uh sort of followed up with that and so actually when i played morrowind that would have been in university because I remember it actually having a meaningful detrimental effect on my studies. <laughs> <laughs> and that was one of the few times I was so addicted to something I couldn't, um, I was falling behind with my work. <laughs> Is that a precursor to what WoW did to millions? Yeah, although WoW didn't really for me. I, I've uh, played it multiple times and I get to like level 30 or something or 40 and, and start to lose interest around then each time. Hmm. So I've had taken multiple characters to level 30 or 40, so it's a significant <laughs> amount of time, but 
just didn't get its hooks in me in the same way. I think because it's not simulated, I think the world feeling real has, has always been a big thing for me. Right. And Morrowind definitely had that. And um, the later Elder Scrolls games also have that. And World of Warcraft, when you attack, there's a progress bar. Yes. And then a number comes out of the enemy. Right. And that style of stuff was... I, I'll play it and it doesn't ruin the game, but it's just never quite captures my imagination the same way that these kinds of games do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so yeah, E is <laughs> still jump. That's the second or third time I saw you do that. That's funny. <laughs> <every time. laughs> Wait, I actually don't know what this village is. Is this Everyone's strutting over there. <laughs> Very proud. There's a cool thing with the, the villages in this where they, the architectural style will tell you who owns it. So ah. this is Imperial. Um, yes. But if you find a, a Dunma village, it will have different kinds of buildings. I'm going to talk to a guard to find out where I am. Hey folks, if you're enjoying this podcast, Beamed Media has another new podcast I think you'll love. It's called Do We Like, and I co-host it along with my partner Robin. Robin, do you want to explain the show? Thanks, Eric. Hi, I'm Robin, co-host of Do We Like, a podcast where Eric and I debate common people, places, and things to decide if we like them or need to leave them. Join us each week as we debate controversial topics like pickles, underwear, bubble tea, and Queen Elizabeth I? Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, or come find us at dewelike.com. I do like the way that y'all min-maxed playing games or like just getting into a thing. Just like, let's just play the best ones. I don't know. Like, imagine watching movies <laughs> and go like, what's the best movies? Yeah. It's like, okay, I saw Citizen Kane and The Godfather 2. And Shawshank Redemption, I yep. think, is uh, one of the highest rated. I guess uh, those are movies. <laughs> yep. I think that'd be a decent start. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that, that would be. It's like, man, there's a lot of white men in all of these things. <laughs> yeah. So, Alter the Round World got us the the uh, sense of a world, and you know, games as being more than just trying to get to the end. Mm -hmm. And then Monkey Island Two, the dialogue was so good, yeah. and the games being funny was um, a new thing. And I feel like probably that ended up influencing my the games I make more because. When they have dialogue, it's usually, uh, you know, uh, comedic dialogue, and it's in a very similar way. <laughs> We've lost Morrowind. <laughs> oh, actually, no, it's still running. Okay. Uh, okay. Just... Did it auto save? No, I have a test that's made. But the character's name, I think, is <laughs> is Turd. <laughs> 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 hitting buttons. <laughs> well, if you want to hit escape through all this and hit load, the magic of old games on new machines. <laughs> Ultima World never would have crashed like this. <laughs> never would have. Sure, it runs perfectly. So load? Yeah, should test. Yeah, you're in the middle of a fight, so. Okay, back <laughs> yeah, up. I'm ready for it. Although I can't entirely remember. It's, it's, it holds for a while, because I think you're poisoned. There you go. Now we're in the middle of the action. Is that, <laughs> oh, I'm not seeing that health bar, hey. am I? Wow, those things just fall apart. It was a long time before I realized these are not hostile. <laughs> like, <laughs> if you don't attack them, they don't attack you. I'm pretty I sure think. they attack me first, but... I already... <laughs> All right, now we're back in it. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> Nothing happened. So the running speed is a, a sticking point in this game, and I ended up modding it so that there's a ring. Uh, that ring in that first barrel mm -hmm. would boost your speed and add mana regen and basically just change the game to the way I wanted it to play. <laughs> <laughs> can you, you can just do that to the character and make run speed faster? Yeah, so it's... Um, it came with the Elder Scrolls construction set, which is basically sort of the tool they use to make the content for the game. Right. And so you can make an item and just add properties to it. Oh, and so I would add like easy. walking speed plus, or I think it was like athletics plus 100 or something, and then uh, generate three mana a second. The game has no mana regen normally. You have to sleep to restore mana, um, which is a trend that went away actually. Like I was, I always thought that was <laughs> weirdly punishing. If you get to be, yes. if you want to be a magic user. The way you deal with enemies leaves you exhausted and you have to go away and sleep, whereas every other class can just deal with them. Yeah. Were you ever into modding? Yeah, well, I was into making levels for Doom and... Oh, oh god. my god. <laughs> <laughs> I know what this is. <laughs> what the hell? I didn't remember it at first. This is the Scrolls of Icarian Flight. So you, this guy drops from the sky. <laughs> <laughs> and his diary, in summary, says something about, like, he's researching this scroll that will boost his, his, not his athletics, but his acrobatics massively. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, the uh, mistake he's made is that 
he cast one to jump, but he didn't cast one to land. <laughs> so you can take them off him, and if you got if you use it on yourself, you can jump that far too. Oh, um, take his hand. But you need to remember to because it only lasts for three seconds. There's now a maggot inside him. <laughs> I have to say, this game actually does appear to have a lot of chances to hit. <laughs> yeah. But I'm pretty sure if you fire a fireball at someone, it hits them uh, based on be good. actual simulation. <laughs> wow, this is... <laughs> just. Are we fatigued or something? No, you have full stamina. The good news is our unarmored skill has gone up. <laughs> I've really learned a lot about not having any armor. <laughs> Why is this one maggot taking so long? imagine someone watching you <laughs> swing wildly at this maggot. <laughs> not hitting a single thing. Okay, I think we should try the, the scroll of the carrier in flight. Yeah, definitely. Uh, maybe there's another window somehow. <laughs> it has like a, a Windows interface, which is amazing. Where you can resize and drag all these things. It's such a like a PC games thing that, yes. that went away when things became multi-platform. Was having things laid out just so like an OS would lay them out, mm -hmm. and like making it the player's job to organize it and figure <laughs> out what size things should be and all this stuff. It's customizability. Everyone wants it. So there you go. Full customizability. Okay, we can't do a carrying flight. <laughs> there was a tutorial about that at some point, but I could do it. it just all it said was press R to ready magic, but oh, okay. it never works, and I don't know how to make it work. <laughs> yeah, because there is when you switch to magic, you get your hands out yeah. <laughs> in a very like uh, vague way, just sort of point your hands <laughs> forwards like a wizard would. That's where magic comes from. <laughs> uh, so you had mentioned in the in the email before this that Morrowind kind of got you towards uh, PC gamer. Yeah. I started working at PC Gamer as a disc editor, so making the cover discs that go uh, on the front of the magazine, or used to way back in those days okay. when cover discs were a thing with all the demo discs. What uh, do you mean by making them? Oh, uh, just finding the content for them, okay. um, putting them in an interface, writing the descriptions for them, and then sending it all off. I think I've come all the way back to the starting village, haven't I? <laughs> yes. Oh, this is because I'm not where I thought I was because I loaded your save. Right, <laughs> yes. And I wanted to be a writer. I didn't want to make cover discs. And so I would do, I would write stuff uh, for the magazine on top of my other duties. I would always volunteer myself for anything I possibly could. But bizarrely, they didn't have, no one there was really into the Elder Scrolls. They give it, I think they'd read more and given it like 70%. And I think in general, it had gone down with, with the public a lot better. I think that, and so me being the only person who really, really loved Morrowind, I ended up writing some sort of retrospective stuff about it. Uh, I did a sort of diary about it where I talked about the arc of the character that I played where through the uh, enchanting system, I found like a legendary soul gem and then I killed a god to get god's soul into the soul gem and then used that as fuel to enchant a, a ring that would just heal me as a constant effect because uh, you can really customize how things work in this like you can you design your own spells basically it's I want this effect applied in this way to this target so it was like increase health applied to me constantly and that's an incredibly <laughs> powerful enchantment so you need the soul of a god to do it and I did it, and I wore the ring, and I became basically invincible. Like, almost cool. nothing in the game could do as much damage as I was <laughs> healing. And uh, I ended up breaking the game for myself, basically, because <laughs> then I'd already, I think, done a lot in this world, and then I ended up, you know, being all-powerful, being able to crush anybody, and not getting much enjoyment out of that. So I ended up sort of casting that ring into a river somewhere <laughs> and just throwing it all away. Wow. And then just wearing like a simple robe and, and going around the world with a sword, just <laughs> trying to solve people's problems. Yeah. <laughs> so I wrote about that. And then when um, Oblivion became a thing, uh, I was into the Elder Scrolls before it was cool. Mm, <laughs> and yes. So uh, with Oblivion, it became cool, but I was the sort of de facto Elder Scrolls expert. So I got to write the preview of that. Mm. And then eventually got to write the review of that. And that was obviously a really big deal for me. And I, I went, uh, put a lot of effort into trying to do that job right. Like mm. trying to really capture what was exciting about it and uh, write evocatively and recount experiences in a way that was engaging to read. And I remember I would, after writing, you know, the review at the office, I would then, at home, I'd read it aloud and record myself reading it aloud. Because when you read text aloud, you often discover it doesn't read as well as you yes. thought it did. It doesn't flow and actually if the way the way it sounds out loud is probably closer to how it's going to sound in the reader's head when they read it. Yes. And so you'd find all these stumbling points and all these things you messed up. And then on the bus to work on the way, uh, the next morning, I'd listen back to the recording of me reading it and I'd spot a whole load of more things of like, oh, actually, I should phrase this this way and phrase that that way. So I was very, uh, 
was a new writer and I was desperately trying to get better. And as um, PC Game is a very good place to do that because there's loads of people way more experienced than you who will right. give you feedback. And I was like hoovering that up. I would take any <laughs> advice and criticism <laughs> um, I could get. Uh, so what brought you to writing? Were you writing before this in any other fashion? So I've always loved creative writing. I loved um, doing that in English in, in school. And I actually wanted to be a novelist because uh, Douglas Adams was, uh, I was absolutely in love with his books and I basically wanted to do that <laughs> if I possibly could. And the thing, one of the big things that appealed to me about that is you could just do it. You could just, yeah. No one could stop you from writing a book. You could just sit down <laughs> and write it. No one could stop you except yourself. <laughs> and I did stop myself many times. And actually, one of my uncles is a novelist and the other one is a poet. Oh. Um, and, but my dad actually had no creative writing uh, background. Uh, he was an electrical engineer. And yeah, I always wanted to do it. I wasn't suited to writing a book because I just can't stick to one thing that long and structure it in a way that makes sense and stay mm -hmm. motivated throughout the whole process. Uh, and I ended up finding I liked writing short stories more. And in a weird way, that kind of mirrors how it worked out with games as well, because you know, making a AAA game is a thing that, you know, I, I liked the idea of, you know, if you put me in charge of this studio or something, then, then I have some <laughs> ideas about how I would do it, because I was a games critic. Of course. Um, but it was never a, an ambition, really, because it was just so unfeasible to even get into that position. And then, uh, you know, the, the scale of the thing and just yeah. the, the logistics just seemed completely daunting and uh, terrifying. Uh, and then, of course, indie games became a thing, and making one of those, it's kind of like the, the short story version. Is uh, it? I've only heard the opposite. <laughs> I mean, they, <laughs> they take an extremely long time, but uh, less time than, say, uh, or less man hours than, like, the latest Assassin's Creed game, for example. Right. So, jumping into developing your first game, from what I read, you did just jump into it. Yeah, I, was, I wasn't sort of setting out to... Well, I was just trying to learn Game Maker. Yeah. Um, because I'd heard Spelunky was made in that, and I loved Spelunky, and it seemed like that is a game that succeeds just by being brilliantly designed. And it was the design part that I wanted to test myself on. Okay. Like, am I uh, capable of this? And so if I could just learn enough technical stuff just to get to that point, just that where my game design was the, the make or break factor, mm -hmm. um, then I'd find out, can I be a game designer? Is this the thing I'm any good at? Uh, do I enjoy it? And so yeah, I was just learning the tool, and I think the, the project title was gray. I just made like a gray background <laughs> and some black blocks and a brown lump that would jump around <laughs> on it. And, but I, in the process of learning and developing that, it, I never really needed to restart. I didn't have to sort of, you know, scrap it all and then start a game in a different genre or anything. Right. So that just evolved into Gunpoint um, over the course of like three years of my spare time. And it was just very, very lucky development. I just happened to have picked something by sheer chance that was within the scope of a first timer. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not yeah. a massively complex game. Yeah, scope is a common issue. Yeah. And the, the hacking mechanic was not part of the original concept. Um, I just wanted to make something a bit like Deus Ex, but 2D. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, take some, some element of Deus Ex that I liked and, and capture that in a 2D environment that was sort of more feasible for me to build. And I had no idea for what it what kind of hacking the game would have, just that it probably should have some. And then when trying to come up with a mechanic for that, I was kind of thinking back to my level design days of, of when you make a quake level, if you want a switch to open a door, you have to tell the switch to like send a signal on channel 16 and then send, tell the door, listen for signals on channel 16. Oh. And that Weird. freedom of like, I can link anything to anything, like I just choose how these things are connected, right. was uh, empowering and fun. Cool. And so the gunpoint's hacking mechanic was just, what if the player could do that? and just make that really visual and really clean and simple to, to understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. Well, I say that, that was the goal. <laughs> and then through years of testing, we found, oh, people don't understand this. And people, the absolute nightmare is trying to get people to understand the connections in Gunpoint are one way. If you link a light switch to a, if you drag a connection from a light to a light switch, flicking the switch does nothing. Right. Because what you've told it is that when the light turns on, the switch should turn on. <laughs> and so if you find another way to turn on the light, great, you've also flicked the switch, but flicking the switch won't do anything. And that was just, even after we had giant arrows flowing down it and tutorials directly telling people, hey, it only goes in one direction, you must do it in this direction. <laughs> and if they did it in the wrong direction, we'd pop up a message saying, this is the wrong direction, do it the other direction. It was still really hard to get people to understand that. Uh, so speaking of design, uh, like I, I follow you on Twitter, so I see your card game popped up and you're working on kind of like things here and there. And you seem pretty open about how you develop things with your with uh, tactical breach wizards. Mm. Even with uh, heat signature, there was 
like a pretty open stuff about the design of it. Do you, does design not come easy to you, but is that an easy way for your brain to think about things? So like designing games and then how it rules and how things interact with each other? Yeah, I think, uh, or at least it's, it's what my brain wants to do. I'm always curious about how things work. And uh, once I know how they work, I'm curious about, is there a way they could work better? Or is there something that I'm interested in, in changing about this? And when I was a journalist and I interviewed developers, I was always drilling down into the very like nitty gritty of how exactly the system works. What, mm -hmm. what happens if the player does that? And doesn't it suck if this thing that happens when that thing happens? Or how do you avoid this problem? And I was doing that not because I was trying to like crib ideas for game design or whatever. Um, I was doing it because I, for me, that was what I needed to know to know whether to be excited about the game or not. Right. And writing for, for the readers, I wanted to tell them that. So I needed to know, like, I, for me to come back and say whether the system is interesting, I need to know exactly how it works and all, understand all its implications. Mm -hmm. And then I think when I started tinkering with Game Maker and, and um, developing Gunpoint, the thing that... I would always find I sort of knew what I wanted to happen. When I look at the screen or I'm playing some prototype that's broken or, or crappy in some way, uh, I have a sense of like, I think I know what I want to do here. Like I wanted to fling a character around, just click a mouse and have a character fling towards the cursor. It just felt, that felt satisfying in my head. And then when I'm playing other games, you know, I was reviewing games, I would often have a sense of like, ah, oh, this, is, this isn't working because every time you do this, your character comes to a total halt. And if that was just smoothed out, like that would feel nice. Um, mm -hmm. uh, or I'll look at something and just think, I really wish I could sort of, I really wish I had power over this. I wish I could, you know, connect that to that or change how this works or uh, flip that character to my side and that kind of thing. And that's basically the design process for my games. It's just like, <laughs> makes up, well, usually it starts with some kind of concept and idea. And then as I make it, just very much go by feel and think, hmm, this is missing something. And I think I want this to happen. And that's kind of why all my games involve throwing people through windows. Because <laughs> that's pretty, it's very easy to imagine. And you can have a high degree of confidence that it's going to be fun. <laughs> yes, it's pretty visceral action. Yeah. I think, like, it's always been the sort of death of fun for me when you, you shoot someone in a game and just a bar goes down slightly and they don't really react. Right. And they're, they're, there's no kind of consequence to your actions. There's no reaction to it. And that's kind of why the game is called Gunpoint was... Um, the initial idea was just a game where firing a gun is a huge deal and it almost never happens. And that's sort of true of the final game, but it became way more about the puzzles and hacking, obviously, because mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's the downside of not knowing, of doing it all by feel and inventing things as you go along is when you name the game, <laughs> you might not actually have the mechanic that it ends up being about. Yeah, that's, that sort of stuff happens, about going with the flow. And doing it in public, being open about what I'm making is part of that as well, because then I, I not only have my own feelings about what's working, what isn't, I also see what excites other people. Right. And that's, it's not as uh, as cynical as, you know, trying to uh, target an audience or, or try and make what other people want. Yeah. But when you're excited about three different things and you mention those three different things on Twitter or you show them all in a video and everyone just raves about one of them or raves about two of them, um, it's just very natural that you become more excited about that yourself as well. Mm -hmm. And like, oh, wow, this thing is not only something that excites me, it excites other people. That means it's, you know, a viable idea to, to make a game that people will enjoy. And other people's excitement is just infectious. It's motivating. It keeps you, uh, it's what keeps me going, uh, you know, during the three years that it always ends up taking, <laughs> make, taking to make a game. Totally. It's just seeing, uh, having other people be enthusiastic about it. Um, I couldn't do it in secret, I don't think, because it would just be too, too difficult to stay motivated and, and to keep believing that this thing is, is going to excite people. And not even... Uh, I don't think I ever would be able to completely believe a game is going to excite people unless I've seen that it does, because there's so many unknowns there. You just, you know, psychology and um, people's tastes, and uh, there are so many factors you don't know. Right. That I would always, anything that hasn't been announced yet and hasn't been shown and hasn't you haven't given people an idea of what it is, is such a huge gamble. And every, every yeah. month you work on it from then on is, is a month you're <laughs> betting that they're going to like it. And if you're wrong, you've just thrown that away, basically. It's, mm -hmm. If you end up making something you love and nobody else does, then there's a certain uh, satisfaction to that in terms of, you know, um, just the pride of having made something that, that you like. But uh, obviously, there are reasons you want to avoid that situation. <laughs> Not or at financially least, viable, but... I think the thing I sort of advise people to try and do if they're making a game... You know, especially if they're a first timer, is just try and find out what you have on your hands 
is it a thing that you're making only for yourself? Because if no one else is excited about it and no one else think, sees why your concept is good, that doesn't mean you have to stop making it. Uh, oh God, Cliff Royces. <laughs> uh, but you should know that information as soon as you possibly can. Like you, right. want, you want to know that before you spend three years on it. And you can spend three years on it if you like, but you've got to go into that knowing that it's not going to make any money. Um, and equally, if, you, if people are really excited about it, it's useful to know that early on, because maybe that affects what you're going to do with it and how much effort you should put into it. And, mm -hmm. So I like to have a kind of close connection to, to people's reactions to the things I'm making so I can kind of adjust, you know, in real time to <laughs> how much should I work on this and uh, how excited should I be about my own project. Yeah, it's a handy meter to go by and just, yeah, especially when you're now developing, like your, your job is developing, you need that to be successful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is very satisfying to watch. <laughs> City Guard versus Clef Racer. <laughs> I would not have said he was in range, but okay. Oh. <laughs> wow, City Guards are great. <laughs> and totally pro law enforcement now. <laughs> oh no. Uh, but that pretty much brings us to the end. I don't know if we got all the way through the through line, but we started there and that's fine. That's what, it, that's what this is all about. It's just uh, kind of looking back where we came from, where we come from, what affects what, go from there. Uh, do you have anything to promote? Uh, yeah, I guess it would be Tactical Breach Wizards, which is our next game that I'm making with um, the artist uh, of uh, Gunpoint and Heat Signature uh, and the programmer that I worked with uh, on Heat Signature, um, John Winder. Uh, sorry, sorry, that's John Roberts and John Winder, respectively. And we're now we're making an XCOM-type game. Uh, again, it's somewhere between XCOM Into the Breach, but with wizards in modern-day tactical gear. And it's a sort of story-driven possibly puzzle-solving-ish game that lets you rewind your turn as many times as you like, so it gives yeah. you lots of room to kind of experiment and try interesting strategies and without any the fear of, of losing things permanently. Mm -hmm. And you can find that at wizards.cool. Ooh, it's a good, uh, it's a good URL. <laughs> Thanks. My one question, this is my personal question. So this is the first season of this podcast, and it's personal history of games. The abbreviation, should it be FOG, P-H-O-G, or P hog. <laughs> uh, I think fog. Okay, that's one for fog. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for for being on the show and for playing Morrowind, and hopefully you had a good time. Thanks for coming out. Yeah, thanks so much. This is really fun. Yeah, and hopefully you have a good rest of your packs. Yeah, you too. You can hear more of the personal history of games on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever else you listen to podcasts. If you enjoyed this episode and want to help us out, please leave us a rating and review. For updates, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at PHOGpod, or check out our website at personalhog.com. The show is hosted and produced by Eric Canius, executive produced by Robin Lands. Do We Like is brought to you by Beamed Media, a Canadian podcast network.